give the floor to the people that were flooded. I know maybe some other residents might have some questions or some comments, but I thought we would give them the floor. So that's all. Okay. Yeah, and uh, and definitely, you know, we can stick around and, and answer questions, you know, if we have time um, or, you know, we can always, always reach out afterwards. Um, yeah. And I, I, mean, I don't want to cut everybody off. Just I don't want to, you know, go two hours. And, you know, the, I, I called this meeting for the people, you know, so they could have some information from y'all. So anyways, okay. Definitely. That's it. Definitely. Um, I did want to, I guess my name is Jennifer Dyke. Um, so I'm the storm monitor program manager and the, um, one of the interim uh, ADs um, in transportation and public works department over stormwater streets and right of way. So that's who I am. Um, I do want to um, introduce Anthony Rojas, who's here with us today, and I think he wanted to say a few words. He is Councilwoman Beck's district director. Anthony? How y'all doing? Can you hear me all right? Talk a little louder. Talk a little louder. All right. I'm going to talk a little louder. My name is Anthony. I'm Elizabeth, uh, Councilwoman Elizabeth Beck's district director. Uh, she was. Uh, she wanted to just let me uh, y'all let y'all know that she's apologizing that she couldn't be here. She had prior um, uh uh, commitments to uh, attend to, but uh, just want to let you know that we're listening to y'all and we're here. I'm going to take notes um, and be here for if y'all have any questions or comments regarding our office. So we appreciate y'all coming out. We're listening and we're gonna we're gonna do uh, do everything we can from our office to to help y'all out. Thanks, Anthony. And we also have our uh, transportation and public works uh, department <laughs> interim director Lauren Prayer is here today. So if you want to wave, Lauren. Everyone can see you. Hey, all. Good to see you tonight. Thank you for coming virtually. <laughs> so we've got a lot of other city uh, staff <laughs> today uh, just to help in terms of there's questions. We really wanted to have the experts available uh, to y'all today. So I'm not going to go through and, and try to introduce everybody, um, but but they might chime in potentially during the, the Q&A. And also, you don't have to just listen to me today. Um, I've got three others. Um, <laughs> Our assistant director of planning and data analytics, Stephen Nichols, our engineering manager from stormwater development services in the development services department, and Claire Davis, our flood plan administrator. Well, I'll be talking with you today, so uh, so you won't get tired of my voice. Um, just kind of real quick, um, try to put yourself on mute, and um, and we'll hold all the Q and A at the end, just so we can kind of get through the information, so everyone. Can kind of hear the same thing um, before they start asking questions or, or making comments, just because it's, I know it's so easy to talk um, over each other in virtual meetings. <clears throat> so, with that, let me see if I can figure out how to switch. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, kind of like what Anthony said, I, I just wanted to let y'all know that we have been listening to your concerns um, from the recent rain event. We really wanted to share this information. Uh, about the drainage system today, what we've been doing out there and, and what we're looking at um, in terms of the future. And also just mentioned too, that myself and several from our stormwater team, I know Claire was there, um, our former director or AD was, um, have been presented to Linwood in the past. So back in October, 2015, March, 2017 and November, 2018. And so um, y'all are a great neighborhood. Y'all have always been very active um, and so it, it's good to see everyone again, but it is unfortunate uh, the reason why we're here today. So, uh, so kind of with that, um, I kind of thought let's let's put the question up front. Actually, this was like our our communications person's idea. Don't make them sit to the end and know your conclusion. Um, and so I know everyone's saying, you know, what's the city going to do about this um, and when? And so kind of just to be straight, we wanted to put this slide. Um, up front and say there really isn't a simple, easy solution to mitigate the flooding out there. It's really going to take significant funding project phasing um, to mitigate what's happening in the Linwood area. And we've got areas like this all across the city uh, with very, very similar uh, circumstances. And so what we're going to do right now is we're going to be continuing to maintain the existing drainage network. Uh, we know the area is highly flood prone, so we want to maintain it in a way that it can take that water to the best of its ability. Um, we're also, we've been rehabilitating the drainage system over the last couple of years, and we've got another project in place. We're gonna be working on that. Um, and then we're also developing or reviewing our existing development regulations. So we're working to identify potential refinements 
to our criteria um, to see what's warranted to better protect our community from flooding. And then also, um, we'll talk about coming up kind of what we've evaluated today. We're going to continue looking at options out there, looking at opportunities for partnerships and par parcel acquisition that could potentially be used for stormwater detention to mitigate flooding. Um, and I've talked with Councilwoman Beck about the flooding and we'll be continuing to have those discussions uh, with Council. So kind of just big picture and then we'll kind of talk through all of this, but I wanted to kind of put that up front so everyone kind of knows where we're going with this. Um, I thought it was good just to do a really short program overview so y'all understand um, who you're talking with. Um, we're from the stormwater program, so our mission is to protect people and property from harmful stormwater runoff. So we're really a life safety focused program and the stormwater program, uh, the utility was actually created by a city council in 2006 to establish a dedicated source of funding to address stormwater and flooding needs across the city of Fort Worth. <clears throat> so our program has four primary functions. We maintain our existing drainage system of pipes and channels. We mitigate flooding and erosion hazards through capital improvements. And since we don't, unfortunately, we don't have enough resources, just like everyone else at the city, um, flood warning is really important part of our program. So we warn the community of flooding and erosion hazards through our mapping program and also through our high water warning system flashers. You see one of the flashers up on the screen. And then we also review development for compliance with city standards, really focused on making sure the new development that goes in doesn't flood and it doesn't aggravate the flood risk of existing development. Our fiscal year 23 budget, uh, recommended budget, is roughly $53 million, and the budget is mostly from stormwater utility fees that property owners in the city pay if they have impervious surface on their property. As you can see, we spend a significant amount of money um, on infrastructure maintenance, which also includes um, storm drain rehabilitation. So really trying to proactively go out there and identify where the aging storm drains need re rehabilitation before sinkholes happen. So it's a, it's a big life safety issue. Um, there was one a few years back uh, at the uh, Carroll, Carroll area. So yeah, I, I can see, I, I think some of y'all might remember that. Um, so in addition um, to, to um, storm drain rehab, other big high priority capital project needs are associated with channel rehabilitation, flooding and erosion hazard mitigation. And we're also fronting some funding to um, assist with the Corps' uh, Central City Flood Control Project uh, that the Corps and the Tarrant Regional Water District are working on. And then the debt slice, uh, I just to mention that because it's pretty big, so that actually pays for revenue bond, um, our annual payments for our bond, and all that debt was issued in support of accelerating capital project delivery. <clears throat> so in... Um, 2019 City Council actually approved a fee increase for the stormwater utility fee, a six and a half percent increase. It took effect January 2020 and it gave us the ability to issue um, additional debt and launch kind of a five year bond program really focused on capital project delivery. So we issued the first 54 million in November 2020 and we plan to issue 44.5 million next year. So this pie chart on the slide just shows where that money is going. Um, in terms of um, the, our, our highest capital project priorities. And as you can see here, mitigating hazardous road overtopping locations at streams and channels is our highest priority because of the life safety involved. So in 2018, um, we had unfortunately four fatalities in the city of Fort Worth at channel crossings where the channel came out of the bank across the road and pushed people's cars um, off into the channel. So that's really our highest uh, program priority as you can see here. And then uh, drainage pipe rehabilitation too is another high priority because of the sinkholes that, um, and the dangers um, that can happen from there. And we've done um, actually several projects in the Lidwood area that Claire will mention um, in a few minutes. <clears throat> now I wanted to talk um, a little bit about the rain events. I know it's been in the news a lot. Um, so kind of to share first, this graphic here shows the CASA radar um, estimates for the duration of the storm event. So kind of it went over um, kind of late August 22nd or 21st and then uh, 22nd kind of that morning. So kind of over the, oh, a little over 24 hour um, duration. And so as you can see here, kind of this pink and red area, this is um, kind of where the, the most rainfall was estimated to fall based off of the radar. So between seven to eight inches of rain in, in those pink and red areas. 
<laughs> and then uh, what you see here is while radar um, estimates or while the radar is an estimate of the rainfall, this these um, dots on the screen are actually rain gauge data. And so they're much more accurate than the radar. And so these are at city of Fort Worth rain gauges that we have spread across the city. And so you can really see here over the duration of the rain event, the amount of rain uh, that fell. And so kind of in that central city area, you see we've got those three gauges that all measured over eight inches um, during for the for the duration of the storm event. And then we've got this bar chart here. This shows the 24 hour rainfall recorded at city of Fort Worth rain gauges for the um, storm event. And the red bars are the new 24 hour maximum records set for this specific storm for the specific gauge location. And so the blue bars um, are the maximum 24 hour record rainfalls that weren't exceeded for this event. So they're past records that have set and they're, they haven't been broken yet. So as you can see here, um, this was a, a pretty significant rainfall across the city of Fort Worth. Um, these lines here show in terms of the 25 year event and the 50 year event and 100 year event. And so I just kind of highlighted the Bryson Hewlin um, rain gauge on here, which is, is not too far from y'all. And so that registered for the 24 hour duration um, and over a 50 year event. So it's, it's a lot of rain that was received. <clears throat> so, so even though there was a lot of rain received, um, I wanted to talk about kind of the storm itself. So the rainfall, is, as you'll probably all remember, it wasn't continuous over the course of the event. And so we had a consultant looking into the rain gauge data a little bit more to understand what happened. Um, and basically for the Linwood area, we feel like that it was really hit with kind of two back-to-back -back roughly five-year events um, over the whole longer duration storm event. And so Claire's gonna talk about flood risk mapping in a few min minutes and put that up on the screen. Um, and point out that the, the five-year flood risk map that we have is very similar in depth and extent to what Linwood seemed to experience based on our review of photographs from the community members. So the five-year event has a 20% chance of occurring in any given year in any given location. So the amount of rainfall is really, um, it's not too common, um, but, it, but it is something that's not a rare event definitely and, and that it does happen in the city of Fort Worth area. So the flood mapping that Claire will show in a few minutes also shows that the flooding was really due to the size of the existing drainage system, not the rain event itself. Um, and so, so he'll talk a little bit about the capacity of the drainage system. Um, and, and really to the drainage system functions, um, how it works in terms of the Trinity River system. So the Linwood area outfalls to the Trinity River system and the river elevation was low enough so the local drainage system should have been able to drain through the flap gates into the river. So that's kind of what we wanted to really try to get a better understanding of what happened in the Linwood area during the rain event. So this map shows just the flooding that was reported over the duration of the storm across the city of Fort Worth. So as you can see here, um, it was a pretty significant event over, over 50 homes across the city flooded over 237 vehicles. Um, a lot of police and fire calls, um, and a lot of that was really focused on the, the central city of Fort Worth. And you can kind of remember the radar too, um, and those rain dots uh, where, where over, um, I guess the central city had over a 50 year event um, for our rain gauges. So also I wanted to talk about the drainage pipe check that we performed before and after the rain event. So knowing this area was highly flood prone um, and had flooded recently, we did go and look at the inlets on Bristol, Templeton and Wingate um, on August 19th in advance of the event to really make sure that they weren't clogged and they were ready for the rainfall. Um, and then after the rain event, we went out there again. Um, we didn't see any clogs, but we wanted to put cameras through the system because we really wanted to make sure because the flooding was so significant, we wanted to make sure there wasn't a clog like further down through the drainage pipes. So on August 29th and 30th, we went out there. Um, we, uh, Cameron Templeton, Bristol West and West 5th Street, um, and we didn't find any clogs. And so that really did help confirm too that the impact of the rain um, was really 
or the, the flooding was really a caused by the, the capacity of the drainage system itself. So there wasn't a clog or anything that we found. <clears throat> um, and two, just to point out, uh, drainage system capacity problems are really common across uh, Fort Worth, especially in the central city, because these areas were developed before our more modern drainage standards that we have today. So with that, I wanted to hand it off to Eric Flatiger, our Assistant Director of Planning and Data Analytics. Um, and so Eric, I'm gonna have to control this for you. So just kind of tell me when to advance. Okay, that'll work. Um, thanks, Jennifer. And uh, thank you everyone for uh, participating in this, uh, this meeting. Um, and, you know, the, obviously lots of impact out there um, and, and obviously you all have a lot of concern about it, so. I just wanted to walk through a little bit of just information about the area and a little bit about um, sort of the long range planning for the area zoning. Uh, I'm in the planning and data analytics department and we're responsible for the city's long range plan, the comprehensive plan um, and, um, and some urban village development type things. Uh, we work with our development services department. And those are the folks that actually review development applications um, and, you know, issue building permits, do inspections, things like that. So, I uh, just wanted to start by showing the, the 2003 aerial. So, this is before the uh, West 7th Urban Village was designated. It's before, uh, certainly before the Linwood area was redeveloped. Uh, and what you can see is that there is a lot of development there. So, in 2003, before redevelopment began to take place, there were a lot of uh, buildings already on the site. Uh, a lot of those buildings have been uh, removed and replaced by uh, by other newer buildings. Uh, but this is an area that, as Jennifer was describing, really has a, a history of some flooding issues, uh, and you know has been developed for for quite a long time. Uh, next. So I just wanted to show you a, a zoomed in view of the same map. This is still 2003. Uh, this is still before redevelopment really took hold. Um, what you see is the uh, park uh, in the center and essentially the Linwood neighborhood as it existed in 2003 uh, surrounding it. Uh, you can see the streets, Carroll is on the, the, the east, Weisenberger at the north, uh, and then universities over on the west side. Um, so, what you see is is essentially a single family neighborhood uh, that was uh, pretty much fully developed at that time. Uh, a lot of those houses uh, were, you know, were purchased by investors over over a period of time, um, and ultimately became the um, you know the focus of redevelopment efforts, uh, led in part by the development community itself, and and you know in some part the uh, the property owners as well. There were a lot of a lot of rental units out in this area, but uh, a lot of these homes uh, were there for quite a long time before 2003 as well. Next. So, um, this is what the 100 year floodplain looks like uh, overlaid onto that map. So, you can begin to see where the 100 year floodplain impacts are. Uh, and again, this is FEMA's 100 year floodplain. You'll hear more about. Uh, some uh, additional analyses that the city has done recently uh, that will show an extension of this, but uh, this is this is sort of what the regulatory floodplain area uh, currently looks like, and this is the 2003 version. So the floodplain hasn't changed, but we'll show you the um, the more recent development uh, in a moment. Next, okay. So moving to 2022. Um, this is what the area looks like right now. And this is sort of a, you know, th this view is giving you really the context of the Linwood area. You can still see Sandoval Park there in the center uh, and the uh, development around West 7th. Um, the parks are indicated in the green um, and you can see the Trinity River location, et cetera. Next. So this is the same 2022 aerial image, uh, but we've zoomed in here to the Linwood area itself. Uh, and you can see again, the park in the center. Uh, you can see that the, in, in a lot of those lots, the rooftops that were 
single family homes have been replaced now by a variety of uh, housing types, you know, townhomes and so forth. Uh, the uh, apartment complex over there next to the first flight park uh, is visible. Uh, so you can see that there's been a lot of infill development that has occurred since 2003, um, and, it, and it continues to occur. Next. So this is the same 100 uh, year flood plain image overlaid onto that area. So that gives you a, a sense of uh, where the uh, FEMA 100 year flood plain is located uh, with respect to the, the redevelopment activity that's taken place. Uh, as well as the older structures that are still are there. Next. Okay, so uh, this is the city's future land use map. So this is a component of the comprehensive plan of the city, which looks forward 20 years um, and covers a, a wide variety of things that the city uh, does and uh, the city's activities. Uh, really, it's intended to serve as a guide for uh, growth and development in the city of Fort Worth, uh, looking out uh, 20 years and in some cases beyond. Um, it is uh, a, a map that we use these color codes for. Uh, the color coding that you see, there's a lot of pink here, that bright pink color, uh, that is mixed use. So mixed use is a, a future land use map designation uh, that identifies areas that we expect and, uh, and in, intend for a variety of development types to occur, a variety of uses uh, to be present, and really be focused on walkable neighborhoods. So uh, walkability is key. It's a higher level of design. So the, the building designs themselves um, you know, tend to have more enhancements to them. They address the street more directly they create a pedestrian oriented uh, place. And as residents of the area, I'm, I'm sure that you're, you know, that's one of the things that you like about it is you've got quick access to a variety of different destinations in the area. You've got, it's, it's a pretty walkable place. Uh, the design uh, is, is pretty advanced uh, in that area. Um, so this serves as, as a guide for development. Now it's actually implemented by the zoning map. Uh, the zoning uh, ordinance is how the city actually controls development. Um, and the expectation is that the zoning map uh, will be implementing the future land use plan, which is what you're seeing right here. Um, so again, the pink is mixed use. Whoops, got ahead of me. Um, the bright yellow color that you see, as you might guess, is single family residential. Uh, the uh, green obviously is, is parks and, and open space where the cemetery is. That bright red is, uh, is general commercial. Um, so really expected to be uh, a type of commercial activities that serve a wider area. Uh, that's, you'll, you'll see car dealerships and things like that in those locations. Uh, that, that purple color that you see up near the river is industrial. So that's a light industrial category that's uh, intended to provide uh, locations for, uh, you know, sort of light manufacturing for, um, you know, some uh, warehousing activities, things of that sort. Uh, but in the center around that uh, Sanibel Park green that you see, uh, there is, uh, a sort of crosshatch of, of a yellow and a brown color. Uh, that is urban residential. So urban residential is a feature land use map designation that's adopted as part of the comprehensive plan. And uh, what this identifies is a location where we anticipate a variety of housing options to be present, um, anything from single family homes, uh, through duplexes, triplexes, townhomes, uh, small apartment buildings, uh, and up to uh, larger apartment buildings as well. Uh, in the future land use designation is, uh, is allowing for that mix of residential activity to take place in the same area in a walkable pedestrian friendly area. Uh, and it is not 
you know, it, it doesn't specifically support commercial activity. It's really intended to be a residential district. Next. So Eric, someone asked what the light pink is. Want to explain what the light pink is while we're on that slide? Oh, okay, sure, certainly. Um, there's not a whole lot of it, so I, I didn't didn't mention that. But that is neighborhood commercial. So the bright red is general commercial. The the light pink is neighborhood commercial. Neighborhood commercial is intended for commercial service retail activities that. Uh, they really are focused on serving the neighborhood as opposed to serving a broader uh, area of the city. Um, and since you brought up things that I didn't mention, uh, there is some orange that you see west of the park, uh, and that is low density residential. So that's really intended for uh, sort of duplexes and townhomes, that, that kind of development, um, not intended for apartment. Uh, complexes. Uh, the brown that you see up in the northwest of the map is uh, medium density residential, and that is intended to accommodate apartment complexes. Okay, so this is the zoning map. So this is a component of the city's zoning ordinance. This is a regulatory document. Um, it identifies the types of uses that you're allowed in each of these different categories. Uh, it is focused primarily on the use of property. So is it is it retail? Is it residential? Is it in, an industrial use? Um, it and, and what you're seeing here really is in large part uh, a remnant of conventional zoning. Um, the bright pink that you see is still that mixed use, which is not really conventional zoning. It's more uh, along the lines of a form based design oriented zoning classification. But a lot of the rest of these, you see the letters that go with the zoning categories as well as the colors. Uh, so uh, B zoning uh, is uh, again shown in that in that light orange color. B zoning is. Two family zoning. So it allows duplexes. It does allow single family residences as well, uh, but it doesn't allow commercial activity, industrial activity, um, you know, larger apartment complexes. Uh, it is specifically to accommodate uh, single family and duplexes. Um, again, that brown C color, C is our multifamily. Uh, zoning for um, sort, of, sort of middle density, uh, and that's what that brown color is showing. So again, it accommodates um, apartment complexes. It can also accommodate sort of lower intensity residential uses as well. Um, and you can see that around the Sandoval Park area where Linwood uh, proper is located, there's kind of a mix of things. Um, some of that is a similar crosshatch with yellow and brown uh, coloring, and that is our urban residential zoning district. So we have urban residential as a future land use map uh, designation for planning purposes, and also for zoning for actual regulation of development activity purposes. So the J, the K, those purple colors that you see, that's industrial. J is sort of medium intensity industrial, K is heavier intensity. The PDs that you see that have a crosshatch color of their own um, are, are planned developments. So they are a modified version of the underlying zoning category, uh, often stipulating uses that are not allowed, uh, sometimes stipulating some development standards as well, but often it's focused primarily on, on uses that are not allowed in the district. So the PD that you see there immediately east of uh, Sanibel Park uh, is a gray and pink coloring uh, crosshatch, and that is uh, showing that it's planned development, but it's based on mixed use zoning. That's where that pink is showing through. Um, so that's that's kind of a quick tour of the zoning map. It includes development standards like setbacks, uh, like building heights, things like that that, that regulate 
uh, how you place development on the site. Um, and, um, you know, as building permits come in, they, they need to meet more than just the zoning standards. Uh, they need to meet other city standards, uh, including uh, standards related to flood plan and, and flood control. Next. So this is a zoomed in version uh, and specifically highlighting that urban residential UR zoning category. Uh, and you can see a little bit more clearly here where it's uh, that cross hatch of yellow and sort of a, a brownish color. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of B zoning that's, that exists as well, that sort of light orange color that uh, for single family homes and duplexes uh, you can see the light pink E. E is a designation for neighborhood commercial development in our zoning ordinance. Uh, and we talked about I and J as two different uh, levels of intensity for industrial uses. Um, C is that apartment designation uh, that has its own uh, development standards. Um, and we recently modified the development standards for C zoning and D zoning, uh, which you don't see any here, uh, but those two apartment complex type zoning districts, we've modified to be more similar to urban residential, residential in that uh, they discourage um, large parking lots in front of the buildings. Uh, they bring the buildings closer to the street to help create a more pedestrian oriented place. Um, and of course, we talked about uh, mixed use, that pink color. Uh, we have two designations of mixed use. We have MU1, which is our low intensity district, and we have MU2, which is a higher intensity district. Uh, again, with um, the focus being on uh, design of the buildings pedestrian orientation, so highly walkable neighborhoods is what we're trying to build with that uh, zoning category. It provides a lot of housing choice, so you can anything from really a single family home all the way up to an apartment and pretty much everything in between. Uh, and then it creates a, a transition of density. So urban residential is often seen near urban villages as sort of, you know, a, a transition between higher intensity uses and sort of standard single family, um, you know, low intensity, um, larger lot size development. Uh, so that's a quick tour of uh, the site of planning uh, that relates to it as well as zoning that relates to it. Thanks, Eric. I really appreciate that. I know there were some questions we received before the meeting uh, for kind of this type of information. So that was really helpful, I think, for for um, people who wanted to hear about that. So, um, so now I think Stephen Nichols uh, is going to talk to us about um, kind of uh, the kind of flooding problem and development regulations. So, Stephen, are you there? Stephen is our engineering manager in our stormwater. Development services and the development services department. All right, good evening, everyone. So the area has a long history of flooding, um, sort of in the early 1900s and 1946 or 7, I believe. There was a flood from the Trinity River that reached, I want to say, maybe the second floor of the Montgomery Plaza building, just for reference. And some of those floods are the reason that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers came in and constructed the levee system. And so looking through the re reported flag information we have, it, it appears we've had some sort of flag incidents in the area every year or every other year um, since uh, around 2014, based on records I found. So sort of some flooding in 2014, 15, 17, 19, and um, obviously 2022. <clears throat> so there, there is a large drainage area that contributes to the Linwood area and parts of uh, West 70th and Camp Bowie and so the, the upstream area drain down and end up in the Linwood and um, so the industrial and 7th Street area and it gets very flat through there. And so similar to the roadway system, 
Um, you can sort of see that there's a fairly steep topography coming down towards the area and that flattens out just like 7th Street. It's very flat through there. The Linwood Bailey's area, you sort of the terrain undulates a little bit, but it's still generally very flat. Um, the systems that are there were built in the 1920s, well before we had sort of modern design standards. And those systems were generally considered to convey maybe less than the one year storm event. And so flooding is fairly frequent. When the Trinity River levee system went in, it stopped the river flooding that area, but it also creates a barrier from the upstream runoff reaching the river effectively. So the combination of the levees being in place and the undersized storm drain systems creates a situation where there's a, effectively what we call a sump condition in that area. And you can sort of think of a sump as being something like a bathtub. Basically, the water goes in and has trouble escaping. So in order to prevent the river flooding up through the storm drain systems behind the levee, there are flap gates which um, close when the river is high, but remain or should remain open when the river is low and allow stormwater runoff to leave the drainage system and exit into the river. Next slide, please. So new development has to comply with the seas drainage standards. Uh, most of our drainage standards apply when development is one acre or greater in size. We model our standards or actually adopt quite a few of our standards from the North Central Texas governments, sorry, regional governments. And they, they put together the ICEWIM program maybe 15, 20 years ago now. And we originally adopted a lot of those standards in 2006. So new development does not have to fix existing flood problems, but they can't make it worse or they're not going to make it worse. The general principle that we follow is what we call no adverse impact. And developments of one acre or more have to demonstrate through engineering analysis that they do not cause an adverse impact through the zone of influence. And just so briefly, the zone of influence is a concept around you know, a very small project in a very big watershed probably doesn't have a significant impact. Um, so, for example, if there's a, a duplex being built, maybe up on Camp Bowie, they're not going to have to analyze down to, say, Montgomery Plaza to determine their impacts. The idea is that within an area around that development is where it has the most impact. So, for example, a neighbor is most likely to be impacted. But once you go, you know, a quarter mile, half mile away, then the impacts are somewhat um, unmeasurable. And so the developments that we do review, they de they have to demonstrate that there's not an increase in peak runoff, um, or if there is an increase in peak runoff, then there's available capacity for that. They also need to demonstrate there's not an increase in flood depths on um, houses, for example, and they also need to show that they're not increasing erosion risk. Next slide, please. Okay, so we review a lot of developments over an acre, but we don't review all developments. The ones we do look at are anything within a finger floodplain that requires a permit. That's part of the city's uh, participation in the NFIP. We review Again, anything over an acre, we review common plans of development over an acre. So that, that's where you have multiple, multiple developments of multiple phases under the same common developer or landowner. And we look at that as, as one development. We also review all plats. Um, we, we review a bunch of other development applications, but I won't go into those right now. Um, so some of the things we check for, you know, we expect that where, where there's a flood risk, that building finished floors will be set two feet above the 100 year flood risk. Uh, within the Linwood sump, for example, um, again, I mentioned it's kind of like a bathtub. So where a development is working in the floodplain, we expect it to provide compensatory volume for that. So, for example, if they put in a cubic foot of dirt into the floodplain, 
we expect them to find or excavate a cubic foot somewhere else within the floodplain to make sure that overall that flood elevation doesn't go up or down. Uh, it's probably worth noting at this point that the FEMA floodplain in that area is a fairly simple volumetric approach. So it, it kind of looks at you know, if we have a hundred year storm within that watershed, we know what that volume will be. And if we you know, place that volume behind the levee, what does that floodplain look like? It doesn't um, it doesn't really account for all the all the dynamic things that happen between the runoff staying at the top of the hill up near Camp Bowie and getting to the bottom of the hill at the outlet to the river. Um, when we're looking at properties or developments, we make sure that they're not grading and constrain runoff towards the neighbors in such a way that cause impacts. And they're not allowed to increase runoff if there's no available capacity through the zone influence. So if we have development less than one acre, if they're not platting, if they're not part of a common plan, they're not in the FEMA floodplain, then those developments do not get review from, from my team. Next slide, please. So for those developments less than one acre, there is um, no review. But even for developments over one acre, we do not look at the interim impacts. So for example, during construction, uh, that there, there may be a time during that construction activity where the site is not fully mitigating their impacts um, because they're in the middle of installing all the infrastructure that they would need to mitigate impacts, for example. And we do not look at the total volume of runoff from a site. So um, we look at peak discharges and velocities, but we don't look at total volume. Next slide, please. <coughs> so the streets are an important part of the drainage system. You know, the curb and gutter conveys runoff to inlets and inlets to storm drains and like the channels and, and rivers and so forth. And at least since 1975, uh, we've had criteria in place that requires streets to convey the five year storm at the top of curb. Um, and then the 100 year storm within the public right away. So the idea there is that this, the, during a storm event, a fairly significant storm event, the street acts almost as an open channel in a way, conveying runoff to inlets and storm drains. And the goal is to keep the 100 year storm event within the right of way, which would in turn protect private property. So streets in Linwood, for example, that were built prior to these stands being in place, were not, were not designed to those criteria, were not designed with, with those kinds of protections in mind. Next slide, please. Oh, thank, thank you, Stephen. I think at, at this point, Claire is going to talk. Um, Claire Davis is our flood plan administrator and talk a little bit more about the drainage area um, and flood risk using our aerials. Evening, everybody. As uh, Jennifer said, I'm the flood plan administrator for the city. And uh, you can probably imagine that I'm quite familiar with Linwood. So I've been working with development in this area for basically my whole career here with the city. And when Stephen mentioned uh, development in the floodplain and and the offsetting volumes of, of fill material. That's basically the type of thing that we've been re regulating in the Linwood area, uh, in the FEMA floodplains at least. Um, on this slide here, you can see four drainage basins. These are all four separate basins that have their own storm drain systems, but uh, at some point or another, they all contribute to flooding that's uh, kind of within the Linwood and the Bailey's area that's uh, north and south of White Settlement and generally east of University uh, Boulevard there. Uh, you can see uh, Linwood Park is generally in the middle here in the green uh, shape. And then around the perimeter on the east and the north side, there's this the system of levees that, uh, that uh, Stephen also mentioned. Uh, those are the, the systems that protect the neighborhood and the area from flooding from the Trinity River from the Clear Fork or the West Fork Trinity. Uh, but they do create that, that standing water situation when uh, the Trinity River is high. Uh, next slide, please.
So here we've got, uh, and this is the storm drain system that exists uh, in these different uh, drainage basins. Uh, you can see that some of them are quite long over in the Monticello area. Uh, they reach from all the way nearly to Camp Bowie and then drain out uh, towards the, the West Fork uh, on the, the west side of the, the cemetery there. And then as you get into the more uh, commercial and uh, heavy residential area of Linwood and uh, the Bailey's area, you've got a lot of storm drains that are on a very regular grid. Um, those generally follow the streets wherever they can, and uh, they typically drain on the, I guess on the, the Bailey side, they drain to the north, into the West Fork Trinity, where you can see the blue circle on the north, and then uh, the Linwood area and the kind of West Seventh all drains back to the east towards, uh, generally towards Forest Park. There's a, a, an outfall to the Trinity River there, the Clear Fork Trinity there. And you can you can tell that this is a, a complicated drainage system. There are places where uh, the storm drain systems go uphill and downhill, and there's even places where the systems kind of cross back and forth into each other. So it's a, definitely a very complicated drainage system. And as you can see in the, the little table here, these are the dates that some of these systems were installed. They you go from the 1970s all the way back to the 1920s. And a lot of that work was done in the you know the 40s and the, the 1970s time frame. So we've got older systems out there. Uh, some of them are generally made to the relative current standards, but a bunch of them are much older. And uh, like Stephen noted, they they just don't carry the amount of water that we would uh, be requiring a storm drain system to carry these days. Uh, next slide, please. We do work really hard to keep these storm drain systems in the best possible condition we can. Um, if we're not able to replace a system, we wanna make sure that it's as functional as it can be per the design that it was constructed to. And uh, we've really paid a lot of attention to the, the Linwood and Bailey's area. Um, the condition of the storm drain system in Linwood, there's about seven miles of pipe out there. It was evaluated in uh, 2020. Uh, we did a CCTV evaluation out there, as Jennifer mentioned. Um, the result of that was that there are several high priority storm drain projects uh, to be uh, constructed out here. We've got uh, Post Street from uh, West 7th to West 6th completed in 2020, uh, and then from West 6th to West 5th was completed in 21. So uh, those are the, the newest that we've got out there. And then uh, also from uh, the intersection of Post and Azalea to uh, 196 West Post Street completed in 2021 as well. Um, Weisenberger has uh, had a system updated from uh, Adrian Street to Curry completed in 2021. And then our rehab program is planned for uh, Merrimack from Mercedes Avenue to Carroll Street and from Carroll Street to Merrimack to West 5th. Uh, that's currently out to bid and uh, hoping to go to construction in summer of 2023. Next slide, please. On this slide, we've got uh, the FEMA floodplains that we've mentioned a couple of times. Um, the blue lines are the, the stream center lines that we have mapped. Um, those are ones that are either the Trinity River or older uh, stream systems that are out there. You can tell that there's just not a lot of streams in the, the Baileys or uh, Linwood area. The, the general trend back in the day was to uh, put pipes where the existing streams were and then pave over the top of those so that you have uh, more usable land uh, to develop and, and just get more use out of. Uh, could have been residential or commercial. Uh, the, the theme was let's cover up the, the old streams and put pipes in there to carry the water away uh, to keep it from being a nuisance. And so what you end up with is no streams really left where there used to be streams. However, the, the slope of the land knows where the streams used to be. And that tends to be where the water will will flow uh, when the smaller pipes overflow and uh, run over land. Next slide, please. And this is what I was talking about earlier uh, when I mentioned that the these drainage basins, they may be separate basins now, but um, when they start to overflow, they all start to head towards uh, the Baileys and uh, Linwood area. And so you've got over here on the west, on the left side, you've got that drainage system that comes out of Monticello, um, that, that storm drain system uh, is overwhelmed and then it collects down there 
off of White Settlement, and then uh, will eventually run through the cemetery, and then it will cross University and into uh, the Linwood area. So that's one area that's got a kind of a cross flow path, um, and then you got additional drainage coming from the south, draining towards the north. Um, this is all part of what we found when we had a, a basin wide uh, drainage study that was completed uh, from 2016 to 2017. We really wanted to look more closely at what the flood risks out there were so that we can start evaluating alternatives to see what uh, mitigation costs and options were going to be. And again, the FEMA floodplain is, is in the purple with our study floodplain in the blue. And one good way to kind of look at the, the purple floodplain in the Linwood area is this, like Stephen mentioned, it's basically bathtub water. It's, it's standing still. It's water that collects at the bottom of the hill and then fills up the tub. The blue water is basically moving downstream and downhill from those higher areas to the west. And it, as it drains you know, downhill towards uh, Linwood, it's more of a moving water situation. So it's, it's got a different type of analysis to it than the FEMA type floodplain. And it also gives you kind of a more meaningful look at what those flood risks appear to be around this area. Next slide, please. Um, as part of that study, uh, we looked at different uh, recurrence intervals of storms. Uh, this, uh, we, we started to add a little bit of a depth feature to uh, the flood uh, mapping that we've got. Again, purple is the FEMA floodplain. That's going to be an elevation of 537.3 above uh, speed above sea level is how we're measuring all this. And then uh, kind of the more pixelated floodplains and drainage with the blue and orange and red, that's the one year or the 100% chance storm of every year. Every year you expect to get the storm. Um, the, the storm that you expect to get every year is going to collect and uh, fill the streets up along the university and then down into the Templeton area and Merrimack. Um, you can see some areas that are getting into the one to two foot depth kind of situation. Uh, wherever you've got some of these intersections coming together where the water just can't get into the storm drain systems, it's going to collect there and, and create a kind of a deeper flooding situation right there at those streets. Next slide, please. Again, this is another a little more intense storm. This is a five year storm or a 20% chance of, of seeing this type of storm every year. And basically, um, this is the storm that, that we saw experience uh, you know, on the 21st and 22nd. These, this is a, roughly a five year storm, uh, but the, the flooding that you see is still pretty significant. Um, there's depths that are more than three feet in some places, uh, particularly along Templeton, and then down on the Norwood on the south side of 7th Street, there's significant flooding down there as well. Um, this is just a, you know, this is the, the way these undersized storm drains function. Um, if, if there's not enough pipe capacity to get the water out to the river, and if the river is also up, um, that could contribute to, you know, some reduced capacity in the storm drain system because water's basically trying to push other water out of the way to get down to the river. And that's the kind of flooding that we saw. Um, next slide, please. And then this is this is what the storm is that we we base all of our designs on. This is what we call the hundred year storm, or you, you've heard it called that probably. Um, it's really just a one percent chance occurring every year. Um, all of your FEMA storms are based on this one percent chance storm, and that's what they base all their uh, insurance requirements on. But again, you can see it's just a greater and greater spread of water, and it's now starting to match up pretty well with the FEMA floodplains as it gets down to these kind of lower, flatter areas. Um, just a, a much wider spread of water. Um, you've got more water in the you know three to five foot depth in some locations, and uh, this is just water that's basically moving from west to east as it crosses you know over University um, from the west and then down into this area, which is the the lowest spot. Uh, before it gets to the river. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you so much, Claire. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit now about, um, you know, kind of what we've looked at in terms of mid long range term, you know, what could be done uh, based off our evaluation. So as Claire said, you know, we mapped the flood risk out there. We had a consultant come in, we wanted to do a, a good get a good understanding of the flood risk so we could figure out uh, what to do what to do about it. Um, so before we came up with the detailed mapping, 
We actually had um, a planning workshop in 2014 that included city staff, consultants, and infill developers to really talk about ideas to mitigate the flooding out here. Uh, so this resulted in a high level conceptual plan first that identified four ways to mitigate the flooding. So um, these brown, uh, brown lines are storm drain improvements. Um, and then the pink areas are stormwater detention basins. So uh, based off of the amount of runoff, we were estimating uh, around let's see 35 acres um, would be needed to detain stormwater. The green could be a, talked about, we could actually just take the street and turn it into channels and then kind of develop along the channel. So they'd be kind of like a, a greenway uh, development to get the water out. And then lastly, you see here a pump station. So Stephen and Claire talked about the levee system and how um, the levees keep the, uh, the river from impacting the local drainage system, but then when the river is up really, really high, it also keeps the local drainage system from draining into the river. So ultimately a pump station, um, you know, could be needed if the river is high enough up um, and the storm drain system also is high at the same time. <clears throat> so, uh, so back when this was looked at in uh, 2014, 2015 timeframe, this was estimated to cost around 75 to $150 million. This is all very uh, high level planning. So then we brought in uh, another consultant to look at that area in detail to do the uh, the detailed engineering and, and mapping and modeling. And, uh, and what they came up with was um, one of the alternatives was to really kind of focus on this uh, urban village area, the Norwood uh, Crockett area, and to put in um, basically replace these existing undersized lines with larger lines to bring the water all the way out to the Trinity River. Um, and so this was estimated to cost between 15 and 20 million dollars. Um, and so <clears throat> this uh, really kind of benefits the urban village, but I'll show you on the next slide it actually has benefits too to the Linwood neighborhood area. And then to facilitate this type of improvement in the future, when the trail drive road was constructed through the Farrington field area in 2018, we actually added a drainage culvert underneath the road. Um, so after we did some more detailed evaluations of this area, we found out we couldn't run the line down Lancaster because there were some utility conflicts. And so we would need to run the line uh, a little bit down into the Farrington Field property. And so, so we wouldn't have to recut open the brand new street. We actually put a culvert underneath it to facilitate um, this, the ability to build this line in the future uh, if we had the resources for it. Also, I wanted to point out that in 2020, um, the city worked with Urban Land Institute, and this was an, um, um, a, a workshop that Eric's team led um, to really try to work together the city of Fort Worth ISD on how this Farrington Field property could be uh, potentially used or redeveloped in the future. Um, and as a part of that effort, we shared flood mitigation information and needs for this area and uh, workshop conclusions did recognize the need for some kind of regional stormwater solutions. Um, and, you know, potentially how could it be incorporated into the design of this site? Uh, so we wanted to make sure that that was uh, incorporated into their effort. So here's a, a screenshot showing the non-FEMA flood risk uh, that Claire had just talked about. So you've got the existing one-year results on the left. And if we put this uh, storm drain line in and increase the size of the pipe, you can see that there's less flooding. So you can see in the urban village area, significant reduction here. Uh, you've got less colors. And then two in the Templeton area, this is for the one year event. So very a very frequent rain event. You can see the significant uh, difference here. So very, very beneficial to the Templeton area. And then this is for the 100 year event. Uh, so as you can see for the 100 year event, it still has um, really good benefits for the urban village area, it reduces the flooding, so you see less color. Uh, but then once you get further north, up into the Templeton area, it doesn't have those benefits, uh, really because the, the pipe stops, it doesn't go all the way up there. Um, and so because of that, uh, we brought, uh, the consultant looked at another option. Um, so this option here was really kind of focused on, okay, how can we, how could we mitigate the flooding in this Linwood neighborhood area? And so they looked at um, adding in new storm drain pipes over in the, the Monticello area. And so Claire had talked about how the water 
is draining from the west to the northeast. And so once it gets to university, it, it's it's moving um, and a lot of it passes over, it jumps over university and then goes into the Templeton area. So these storm drain pipes over here, the importance of them is that it is capturing that water and then taking it up university to the river before it can even get into the Templeton area. So it's keeping all that water off of Templeton. So Templeton's just kind of having to manage their own water. Um, and then to adding adding new storm drain pipes in that Templeton area to connect to the line um, up university. So, uh, so as you can see here, you know, this would be a huge project um, estimated to be between 80 and 90 million dollars, a lot of uh, street cuts, um, you know, utility impacts and so forth. Um, so this would have to be done in series of phases. Uh, if this was done starting at the uh, very downstream end, so up along the Trinity River um, and then moving south. Um, so we can't build the pipes at the upper end because they don't have anywhere to go. So you've got to start at the downstream end. So just um, if we did something like this, it would take uh, time to actually get to the upper parts of the watershed to get that benefit. And so this just shows um, the existing uh, flood risk down at the very bottom. So this is a hundred year on theme of flood risk for the area. And then it, this shows uh, on the top, it shows the benefits of it. So this is for the hundred year. So, so still, you know, there's flood risk out there, but as you can see, um, much uh, significantly reduced by a project like this. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we talked about long-term, but short-term, you know, what could be done um, so in terms of uh, maintenance, I talked about maintenance earlier. We want to make sure that we're really maintaining the system um, to a high level, knowing that this area is very flood prone and performing pre and post storm event checks to make sure it's performing to the best of its ability. Um, I also wanted to kind of uh, just let y'all know it's really important for residents to report to the to the city if y'all see uh, maintenance concerns, clogged inlets or something that we should look at. Um, you know, use the My Fort Worth app or call the number and, and report that. And we can pretty quickly come out there uh, and take a look. That's what we want to do. We want to we want to catch it before uh, it impacts anybody. Um, also, the non FEMA flood risk initiative is an effort that we've been working on with stakeholders over the last few years. It's really focused on improving communication of the non FEMA flood risk through the mapping, just like uh, Claire and I showed. Um, and also through improved stormwater regulations in these areas where we've done the detailed engineering to understand the non FEMA flood risks in detail. And so the mapping that Claire showed earlier is going to be added to the website, the city's website this fall, um, as well as for other um, areas across the, the central city, several other parts of town, we're going to be adding that mapping as well. Um, and um, we really want, of course, the residents and the developers to have this information so they can consider it early on in their decision making. Additionally, this fall, we're going to be bringing recommendations to City Council about floodplain ordinance and stormwater criteria manual updates um, <clears throat> to really improve small lot development regulations in these FEMA non-FEMA non flood risk areas like Linwood that we have evaluated in detail. And then, um, Lastly, as mentioned earlier, we're going to be evaluating opportunities for partnerships um, and looking to see if there's parcels that could potentially be used for stormwater detention. We're also going to be um, considering if um, we should be, uh, we have a meeting actually set up with the Corps of Engineers in a few weeks to see about updating economic analysis that the Corps has done in the past. And so potentially if we update this, um, we could uh, possibly use that data to help get federal funding to show um, the need and the impact of flooding for this area. We're also participating in the North Central Texas Council of Governments Integrated Transportation and Stormwater Management Initiative. So it's a mouthful. Um, it's really an effort um, to, uh, it's a regional study focused on areas kind of west of Fort Worth and the upstream areas that are developing right now. But the whole intention of the effort is to um, mitigate uh, downstream flood risks from the new development and, and, and flood risks currently. So, uh, so we really want to be participating in that group since it could have an impact downstream on communities like Linwood. <laughs> so kind of in conclusion, 
you know, we've done this detailed planning. We, we have a good understanding of the flood risk and what could be done to mitigate the risk. Um, and then really, we need to consider that in terms of citywide um, priorities, partnership opportunities and resources. And so kind of big picture, the cost of these identified storm drain improvements in the near west side is just well beyond the scale of our stormwater program. So as I showed earlier, we've identified over $100 million of needs to mitigate the flooding in this area. And in comparison, Stormwater's proposed uh, five-year capital improvement program allocates roughly $122 million towards high-priority capital projects. Um, so we, we prioritize our funding based on risk, considering citywide flooding problems with, again, a life safety focus. And so to put our budget into perspective a little bit more, the estimated funding needs to address our highest priority capital um, projects for mitigating hazardous road overtopping at creeks and channels, rehabilitating aging storm drain lines, mitigating uh, flooding to homes and businesses, and restoring highly um, eroded drainage channels is well over a billion dollars, as you can see on these uh, high level estimates on the screen. So, with that in mind, uh, the stormwater utility fee is our main source of funding. We can issue stormwater revenue bonds to pay for projects such as, um, uh, so I guess, hold on. So we, uh, we issue stormwater revenue bonds based off of our uh, stormwater utility uh, revenues. And so we can only issue enough bond funding based off our, of our revenue. Um, the city uses general obligation bonds to pay for projects like street improvements, libraries and police stations but typically that funding is not used for stormwater improvements since we have a dedicated fee store from our stormwater utility fee. Uh, so future stormwater utility fee increases and debt issuances are, is really what's needed to continue um, to accelerate the delivery of high priority capital projects. Um, our program routinely evaluates public and private partnerships. We really try to leverage our resources uh, where we can to get as much um, done as possible. We also regularly look at grant funding opportunities to see if they're available for, for our priorities. Um, and we have uh, the two different alternatives that I mentioned earlier, those two storm drain lines, we've actually put those into the Texas Water Development Board's draft state flood plan. And so having them in the plan gives us the opportunity to potentially apply for some kind of funding in the future. So you have to have them in the plan to be able to apply for funding. So uh, we wanted to make sure that they were there so we had that um, opportunity potentially in the future. We also routinely evaluate um, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management, and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers funding opportunities. Um, lastly, there could be some kind of potential opportunity to form a special drainage district for this area um, to charge property owners or, or future developers additional fees. Um, to, to um, improve the drainage in this area, but that would require some more um, or some detailed evaluation involvement from our legal department. So just trying to throw out, you know, options here. So this is kind of the slide I said earlier, you know, as mentioned again, there's not an easy solution to mitigate the flooding. Um, and so really uh, we're gonna be continuing to maintain the existing drainage system. We're gonna be continuing to take a look at our development regulations um, as mentioned earlier, Stephen talked about um, we don't look at or we don't regulate stormwater uh, runoff volume. And so that is one of the things that we're going to be looking at um, in terms of cumulatively the addition of more and more impervious surface across the city and how that impacts um, flooding and drainage to see should we be uh, changing our development regulations with that in mind. Um, and then again, we're going to be evaluating opportunities for partnerships um, and looking at parcels that could potentially be used for stormwater detention. So lastly, um, while, while we can only do so much at the city, I wanted to throw out things that residents can do. Uh, I know none of these things are really things that you want to hear um, because I know I don't want to hear them, but I think it's really important for the city to share them uh, with you. So one is just, we want everyone to understand what their flood risk is. So we send a lot of annual letters uh, to flood prone areas. I know there's a lot of residents in this area that, that should be getting um, an annual letter. Um, we actually have one going out, I think the end of this month. Um, we also have information about flood risk on the city's one address website under the reference section. 
And if you have questions, you can email our floodplain team and we'll um, respond to questions as they come in. We also recommend flood insurance to um, to property owners that are more at flood risk. So we can actually, um, we do at different actions at the city of Fort Worth so residents can get discounted flood insurance. Uh, so typically um, normal homeowners insurance does not cover uh, flooding from like water coming up, in a, like not a not a flooded water heater or something, but from coming, coming into the house. Uh, so flood insurance uh, is a separate add-on option to your insurance that we do recommend. Um, people can consider flood proofing or structure elevation for their homes. I've talked with people before too that say, you know, they know it's flood prone on their street and they go and they move their car. You know, it's, I know that's not ideal, but I, I've talked to people in different neighborhoods in the city that go and do that. Um, and lastly, I wanted to mention that we do have a um, severe weather alert app. Um, well, we use the Code Red app and Fort Worth, Texas alerts that residents can sign up to receive um, alerts for severe weather. So with that in mind, I know this was a really long presentation. I really appreciate everyone uh, sticking around to, um, to listen to it. And so kind of at this time, I wanted to take comments. And I know, uh, Stacy, you had mentioned earlier kind of that a few people who had actually flooded, giving them kind of a chance maybe to, to talk or comment first. So I think if you could maybe try to do the raise your hand function, um, and, and Linda Stern on our team is gonna be trying to facilitate um, the Q&A or, or the comment session. Jennifer, we have um, quite a few comments in the chat. If maybe we wanna start as, as the order that they appeared. Um, Chris Butler and Pete shop had referred to um, ahead of the August 21st and 22nd rain event that the parenting center yeah. Pete had issues that night as well on the 17th. So just to comment on that. Right. And there, there was that rain event right beforehand, uh, which made then soils even you know, soils were saturated, so that kind of even probably made the, the next flooding a little bit worse. But yes, there was that uh, that flooding event right beforehand. It's a good point. Um, this is Dan. Hey, Dan. Oh, my. Sorry. Uh, no, this is Dan Steinig, and I, I live at 407 Templeton Drive. Uh, as she mentioned, I, I flooded three separate times. Uh, obviously the, the Sunday, Monday night flood, which everyone flooded, but also the, uh, the night of the 17th, um, which was plus or minus two inches of rain. Um, I don't think any house should flood, uh, when it rains that much, but, um, I, I what I want to know is what are we going to do to remedy either, uh, you know, do something in the meantime or before these, cause all these big plans, these grants that are proposed, they're five plus years out. There needs to be something done on Templeton Drive specifically, um, because you're ruining not only people's homes and, and their daily lives, but it's also ruining the property values if it keeps doing this. Um, you know, we pay twelve, thirteen thousand dollars in property taxes a year. I think something uh, needs to be done in the meantime. Um, so, just kind of want to know if there, if there is something to be done now to the drainage systems to uh, mitigate the problem. Uh, but in, in, in between the the bigger uh, the bigger uh, fix uh, of the issue, um, uh, so that's kind of my two cents, and and wanted to know uh, what if there is something to be done now to the problem. Yeah, yeah, and, and as again, um, you know, there's not an there's not an easy fix. So to do something now, we would either need to have amount of property that we could use for stormwater detention um, or to build pipes to take that water to the river. Um, we are going to be taking a look to see, you know, is there available property that could be used for stormwater detention um, that, that's large enough to have benefits. So that is something that we will be looking at um, in, in the near future. Hi, this, this is Dane. Uh, um other Dane, uh, I'm next door neighbors uh, with Dane that just asked. So kind of two things, one to piggyback off what he said, 
I mean, the day that it, the day that we saw two inches of rain, yet we're getting water in our house and it's over, you know, over three feet above street level, um, you know, and looking at the maps and seeing that in three days, you know, three times in six days, you know, the, the issue, I mean, it just seems like it's being, Templeton's being used as a reservoir and for two inches of rain, we shouldn't flood, but it's all coming, like you said, across university, you know, two blocks east, two blocks west, you know, I, I can walk there. And when I'm getting to my house, now it's up to my chest and I'm, you know, six foot three, you know, so, I mean, for the short term, I mean, I've heard some different, different things. We, you know, so you put, you know, in the storm drains that does not allow that water to cross over either like a blockage or something, you know, push it back the other way that can be a much, you know, a much more short term cost effective plan. Cause the issue again, isn't flooding and it isn't the rain. It's us, you know, being used almost as a reservoir and this coming from all these other streets and then just pooling outside of our house. So that's my first question I'd like answered. And the second is, uh, I mean, is there any remedy remedies for Templeton street alone, um, for everybody that's happened to renovate their house, um, you know, possibly, you know, put in piers and lift it up because if there's no short-term solution and, you know, the next couple of years, I mean, it's bound to happen again if we can get flooded from two inches of rain in a day. Sir, I, I, I agree with you. I actually live behind you. I'm on Wimberley Street. The city redid Templeton a year ago and did not replace the drains. So I'm a developer. I know what's going on. This has been a great presentation, and uh, they've flooded us with stuff without telling us how they're going to fix it. So, uh, so I first wanted to, in terms of the comment about, you know, can we put something up to block the water to stop it from coming over into the area? So all of this is basically the natural flow path of the water, and so we can't do a project that would block the water and stop the natural flow path because then we would just flood somebody else. So that's part of our projects is we have to make sure that we're not just stopping the flooding or moving it to another part of town. We just need to take it to an adequate outfall, uh, such as the Trinity River, an area that has the capacity to hold that storm water. But Jim, Jim, seriously, you could have replaced those drain pipes. They're on Templeton, when you redid that, you could have done that. Why? Why are you not accepting that? That's what so, the issue is. So I'll say I, that I'm not familiar with the with the street project that was done, but it wouldn't be enough just to improve the pipe right there in that one stretch of Templeton. We'd have to take no. The water. It would no. It would because what happened from Templeton flooded my place. That's what's happening. So, so another option potentially could be um, underground detention. Of course, we have to look and see in terms of the capacity or what's underneath the street, but that could be another option that we could take a look at. Yeah, and, and kind of you saying that, you know, it, if we if we did that, it would stop, you know, it would go somewhere else where, well, you know, I'm seeing other areas on this map that don't have any color, um, yet ours has all the colors. I mean, then, I mean, it seems like we could do something to not not go flood another street intentionally as much as I don't want my street flooded. I would hate for this to happen to anybody else. But, you know, there has to be in those areas that we're not seeing that and it's the natural flow of water. There's got to be some some kind of solution, you know, and, and I'm not, you know, it's something worth looking into. But there's got to be something from everything coming across university and from coming from Wimberley and from, you know, from every direction. There's got to be one of those that we can pick you know, to, you know, to backflow it the other way, instead of it all coming to us to an area that does not have any color on that map. So that hence, they're not going to potentially flood. It might, you know, it might get halfway up the driveway, might be two feet, but it wouldn't be five, six feet like it was in my house. Well, up to my house. Right. And part of the um, problem is, as Eric talked about, is the area is highly developed. And so we don't have a lot of space to do something like stormwater detention that could just capture all of that water and hold it until the drainage system can slowly release that water. Uh, or well, the well, but, well, guess what? That's the city's that's the city's job. OK, 
we're paying taxes for that. And I love what my neighbor said. That's what your that's what your job is. Don't, for don't don't give us this crap. This is Benny Peak. I also am on Templeton where we have a particularly acute problem of three, sometimes four feet uh, water. People's cars have been destroyed. It's been in our houses multiple times. As Dame, Dame said, even last Wednesday with two inches of rain, the, the floods are, are getting into people's houses. So I think we have a particular problem on Templeton. And the one thing that I have not heard addressed in this presentation um, and so I think Claire did a great job of showing, you know, some things about the flooding. You, Jennifer, did a good job the last little bit talking about some things. But the one thing that I didn't hear mentioned is the fact that on Templeton, the storm drains flow backwards. In other words, it's not just that there's runoff coming from the west across university down the side streets and adding from the runoff on Templeton. It's also coming up in the middle of the street from the storm sewer itself. So it's it's it can't get out the other end. It's stopped up and then water from other parts of the city is then flowing into the system and then up and out on Templeton, which is making the problem much worse. And so that, that's the majority of the problem. I do think it's causing the problem to be multiple times as bad from having witnessed this with my own eyes. I would say that it is the majority of the problem on Templeton's and I don't see it addressed in this presentation at all. So I guess I'm just wondering, are you aware that this is going on? And if you are, what's the plan to deal with that? Well said, gentlemen, the city is just trying to put a bunch of crap in front of us and not let's at least dealing with hear the what issue. they have to say. I mean, I, I agree with you. I'm not happy about any of this, but let's at least hear what they have to say. So, uh, so we have seen your video actually, and we, and we have been talking about it and I will say that surcharging, um, uh, is pretty common in other parts of the city. Um, uh, we, we keep manhole lids, um, in the back of our vehicles because other parts of town, the, the pressure of the water, it just pushes the, the manholes off. So. It is something that we're talking about where we want to better understand um, what's actually causing it in this area. And it's something that, that we are going to be looking into. Um, but kind of as shown earlier, we're responding to citywide flooding right now across the city. So over 50 homes flooded. And so, um, so it's going to take us some time to look into everything because right now everybody's saying, hey, what's going on? And I think it is worth mentioning. You you talked about the development and everything. And if this, you know, you mentioned in the presentation. I mean, this and and we did when uh, in Arlington uh, at that meeting um, last week. And you guys have known about this issue and the flooding and the storm drain. Well, more the storm drain issue causing the flooding on Templeton and in the Linwood area. Yet you continue to approve these massive developments that take away. You know, the more concrete we get you know, the more runoff it is. And then, you know, we've already talked about the point that the runoff is, it has the backflow. So, I mean, yeah, I've never seen our street ever get bad when, I mean, the first thing I see is water coming out of the storm drains and the manhole lid, you know, shaking and then popping off like a foot or two and water just spewing out of it. And that's exactly how our street floods. It has nothing to do with the, too much rain and flooding. It's, you know, at our houses and the amount of rain that lands on our properties and right next to us, that's never going to be enough to get halfway up my driveway, but you know, with everybody else's coming to us and part of that, you know, you guys knowing what the issue is, knowing that it's the problem and continuing to approve these big developments, these big apartment complexes, new buildings, all of that around us. How, how can you do that with good conscience, knowing that that's just going to exacerbate the issue? Well said, Dane. Um, I appreciate, I appreciate. Jennifer, Chris Butler has had his hand nicely raised for a while so if we could chris if you well, want nobody to just answered the question i just asked so in, in terms of the the development so so it's kind of what we showed is this area has always been uh, has always been flood prone so eric showed the pictures of the single family residential homes there that area was still flood prone uh, before the development and so so when redevelopment happens they're not having to fix that existing flooding problem 
Um, and so, so it remains. Um, and I will say, yes, you know, there is more and more impervious surface and that is something that we are looking at our development regulations to see if changes in them are warranted. I don't see how that answers the question of continuing. It, it doesn't, but there, I mean, you're not going to get, I appreciate, I understand. I'm not going to be, you know, not going to be rude about it. I get that. You know, there, you're not going to actually answer the question. You really can't, um, and it would be ill-advised of you. But you know, we kind of know the answer to the question. It's, you know, you you guys knew that there was a problem. Knew this would exacerbate the problem more so than it was. Because I've lived there four and a half years. It's never flooded and gotten into the house. Yeah, have I seen it bad? Have I seen it get part of the way up? Yes. But knowing that that's the issue, and knowing that you're putting in, you know, more of these developments. I mean, yes, you knew that it was it was already a flood area. Uh, or, or storm drain back up to cause flooding. Yes. And if it was halfway up my driveway, that wasn't a problem. But over the four and a half years and all these developments, you know, over the four and a half to 10 years, the more and more that it gets, the worse and worse it gets. So I hear what you're saying. You're not really answering the question. I understand you probably in good faith probably can't. Um, but that's, you know, that that's the truth of it is, you know, you guys knew it would make the problem worse. Yes, it was already an issue, but it was only an issue halfway up my driveway, three, two, three more feet. That's the issue. Can we ask a question? This is Pete and Laura shop. Well, uh, first, let me get with Mr. Butler. I know Linda was saying his hand had been up for quite a long time. Yeah, good evening. My name is Chris Butler. I'm the executive director for the parenting center. We are a mental health social service nonprofit on the corner of 5th and Templeton. And our facility flooded three times. It flooded uh, partially on the 17th. It flooded again on the night of the Sunday and then that Monday. And the, the, the thing that's concerning to me is the Monday flood. I had a third of my staff in the facility and we got trapped in the facility. We had multiple cars that were, were damaged. We had to call off staff um, and you know, for us, we, we have, we filed three claims. We have two flood claims and one roof claim um, based on these three issues. And the roof cl claim has nothing really to do with the city sewers, but I, I now have three claims on my insurance for a small nonprofit. And we are closed to the general public. We've gone to virtual, um, but we've got, we see people that have mental health issues. We, I mean, we're a much needed service in the community and right now I'm weighing the option of if I can afford to keep staff on payroll and what this looks like, because we're probably going to be out of commission for eight to 12 weeks while they renovate the, our building. They had to pull out all of the flooring surfaces. They had to make 24 inch cuts to every room on the entire first floor. You know, right now the estimates over $300,000 um, in damage just to the facility doesn't include content. And it's a huge thing for a small organization like us, and we have no options. You know, there's nothing we can do. We can't build a retaining wall in, you know, around our yard or anything else because anything we do is going to kick it back into the neighborhood. It's not going to solve the problem. But the question that I have is there, there seems to be some level of knowledge and understanding of the issues. And, you know, is there anything that can be done, whether it is, you know, is there any assistance that can be provided with, you know, the, the uh, for compensation for losses or anything like that? Are there any services that can be provided? Because I can only imagine what the neighborhood is going through from a family perspective, but from a business perspective, this is one of those things that that is going to cripple us for a little while. Right, uh, so I will say that uh, you could file a claim with risk management at the city of Fort Worth. So that that is one action you can take. Um, I, I will say too, though, that we don't have funding uh, to just help people um, improve their homes with the stormwater program. So unfortunately, that's something uh, that we don't have. You know, we have over 50 homes um, and, and businesses too. So um, I definitely, you know, understand your frustration um, in terms of other federal programs. Um, I think, Claire, don't we have maybe some, um, like an information sheet that we could provide in terms of potential assistance, or is that all just flood proofing? We have some information on different types of financial 
assistance that could be available. Um, a lot of it's geared towards the you know types of damage that occur in floodplains, not necessarily outside floodplains. So we'd have to look pretty close at that to see how that could be used in this case. But um, that's just to me in these kind of situations, the one of the, the the first lines of defense for an individual property owner is to have some sort of flood insurance uh, that will help kind of offset those costs of, of damages. And it's it's obviously nothing that is going to help you after the fact, but um, yeah, and forward. we're fortunate we have we have flood insurance, but three claims they're going it's going to go through the roof when we renew our insurance, and it's going to happen again, and so at some point we'll be uninsurable. Is that through the National Flood Insurance Program, the NFIP or FEMA flood insurance? Yeah, I, uh, I think it's National Flood. Yeah, I, if it's through the the FEMA flood insurance, I don't think they're going to ever make you uninsurable. Um, they're they're really there to help you mitigate those kind of damages, and they understand that it's you know there's going to be situations where there's going to be re repetitive losses like that. Um, premiums will will go up, but they're you know they're geared to be uh, a mitigation option for folks that are you know finding themselves in harm's way. Chris, well articulated uh, thing. The city is coupled. The next person who had their hand raised was um, Mr. and Mrs. Shops. Yes, um, I have some concerns about something you said earlier about the fact that you have sent out letters and emails letting people know about the flood risk. Um, we have never ever received anything like that. We bought our house in 2020. We were not told anything about a flood risk or we would have purchased flood insurance. I don't believe any of the homeowners on our street have flood insurance because of that. And so we are all out, you know, 60, $70,000. Some people are having to dip into retirement accounts, borrow money. And you keep saying things like, well, there are 50 homes across Fort Worth. Well, that's not that many when you consider how many of them are on Templeton alone. And the fact that there hasn't been any effort on the city's part to help us with compensation, to work with the state or the federal government um, is very concerning. Well, I will say that the city um, did work with the county and know that they are, are looking into federal disaster um, assistance, but that's all uh, being looked into. And so, so far to my understanding, there hasn't been uh, a determination about whether or not that will be available in the future, but that is a, a potential uh, funding opportunity. Are you gonna answer the question about how we supposedly were notified that we were in an area that had flood risk? Yes, yes. Uh, Claire, do you wanna talk about your letters? Because I know that they go out uh, kind of based off of flood risk. And, and I think last year was maybe the, was last year the first year in some of these areas? Right. Last year would have been the first year that we sent letters uh, to areas outside the FEMA floodplain. And that was you know, basically in direct response to the need that we need to get some information out there to folks that are in, you know, some sort of a flood risk area that's not identified on a FEMA floodplain map. And so was that, did anybody on Templeton, 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 Templeton's no. on a, in a 500 year floodplain? That's why. That's probably, they probably didn't send it to the 500 year floodplain. That's, it, it, so most people didn't get flood insurance. I just bought my house on Simpson August 11th. I uh, moved in the 16th. I flooded the 17th. Uh, oh, so I also did, did. I also did the city flood claim that Governor Abbott, I guess, in his article said you can file this with the city. I did that. I hand delivered it to someone in risk management on Tuesday. She called me Tuesday night and said I was denied. And I spent a couple of days on gathering my invoices, how much money I spent, what it's going to cost. Uh, to just get a call back four hours later saying I was denied. So the city's not doing anything uh, uh, for, for yeah. us on Templeton Drive. Uh, they aren't going to do anything because there's no way they took the time to read the 12 page, 12 to 15 page document I put together uh, with estimates plus the flood claim that's from the city uh, to just get a call back four hours later after me hand delivering and say, uh, yeah, we're not we're denied. Uh, we'll send you a letter. So uh, it, it's kind of horseshit. To be honest, yeah, agreed. Um, kind of, kind of to touch on what he said. I would like to know for the, you know, you you said like the fifty homes in Fort Worth, and we account Templeton alone accounts for at least a third of those. 
So if if any of these funds, you know, you guys have funds set aside for who's in floodplains and all that. Well, if we're a third of it and we're not in a floodplain and you guys are looking into the, if that's going to be available for us, either that or the leftover COVID money or wherever you want to find it, um, is is Templeton going to be given a priority for that since it's, you know, a storm storm drain issue and we account for a third of the homes the uh, to the number, if not more, to the number you uh, pointed out. And then also, what is the update on, you know, Abbott declaring it a, a disaster and any funds being released from the state either? Uh, but I'd like the first part of the uh, question answered first. Yeah, in terms of the, the funding, so the stormwater program itself, we do not have funding to provide to residents to fix their homes due to flooding. Um, and so, so, so that's a, a no, we don't have that. And I have not heard any updates in terms of the, the disaster declaration. Does anyone else, any other city staff on the call have any information on that? Uh, this is Claire and I haven't heard anything on updates to how they're going to manage any kind of funding that's available to residents that have had damages. I thought you had mentioned that something for the flood, you know, people in floodplains, there was something for that. And you were going to look into something for a street like ours that is not in a floodplain, but had more issues than the ones who were in a floodplain since obviously we account for a third or more of the number that you just threw out. Right, well, we've got, like I said, we've got uh, a list of the types of information and funding that could be available to somebody in a flood type situation that we are, we send out with other letters that we send out every year. Um, we've been focusing those on the FEMA floodplains because that's, that's where you know, all, not all, but a bunch of the flood insurance policies are located. Um, but we wanna make sure that we're getting that, that same message out to other folks that are at risk. So. This year, uh, we should be sending letters that would go to these non FEMA flood, in, flood risk areas as well. Um, that would include this area that we're talking about since it's one of the studied areas that we have used to identify you know, where these potential flood risk areas are. So I would be looking for that probably within the next probably three to four weeks. And uh, they're actually at the printer right now. So, and Claire, to I guess to clarify that, th those aren't city funding sources, those are other federal funding source potential opportunities, correct? That's, that's right, because the, the utilities you know, isn't really available to individuals. It's it's geared for capital type projects and citywide improvements. Right, and, and so I did want to mention in terms of what we can do right now is we can share a copy of that letter after this meeting with the participants and send it out to Stacy, and she can share it as well. So people have that information now. Yeah, please do along with the um... The link, whoever you said, like the flood in, in your presentation, the flood insurance that, you know, we have a discounted rate or something in Fort Worth, maybe not ours. I don't know what that was, but I would like the link for that because, yeah, now that it flooded, most are denying it. And if they're not, you know, it's outrageous expensive. Do you want to talk a little bit, Claire, about flood insurance in terms of kind of the discount? I, I say just send that out. I mean, I think people have more pressing questions. I don't want to okay. divert the time into that. I'd rather have you send it out via email so everybody can ask more pressing questions. Okay. Okay. Unless Ms. anybody disagrees. Ms. Eva Bonilla, I believe has her, is the next person that has her hand raised. And again, we don't know amongst y'all who has had the flooding issues. So I'm just going by who has their hand raised. Thank you, thank you. Hi, Jennifer, long time. Jennifer's been working uh, in our neighborhood on flooding since I was president in 2015. And uh, we had the biggest floods when I moved here in 2017. So because of that, she really is dealing with it every all the time. She knows Linwood very well in her defense. But uh, I was just thinking, you know, we did finally get the drainage in the park fixed. Uh, last year, and it's working awesome. So Wimberley didn't get flooded like it did in 2017, and I and I was wondering that would that drainage that was placed in the park be the kind that could be put at Templeton because it takes a lot of water out of there, and uh, in like less than 12 hours, you know the the park is a detention and a retention and. Uh, so the water stays there and it takes all the water from Wimberley and pushes it through that drain. I just wondered if, if a drain like that could be placed on Templeton. And I know it took a long time to have it placed. It was a 
a lot of big machinery and everything. And I just wondered if that could be done for Templeton. Uh, yeah, so in terms of the park, we have kind of looked at, you know, possibilities in the park, you know, could we use that for detention? Uh, it, it would, of course, impact the park uh, and the trees there in terms of we would need to to cut down um, and do some kind of, you know, if we wanted to do stormwater detention in the park. Um, so that is something, you know, that we can kind of look at again. Um, I know it's, it's not a huge park, so it doesn't have a huge area. Um, but, but there are, you know, opportunities that we could look at um, in terms of of park drainage and that's um, parks across the city, you know, that's oftentimes are, are built in those lower areas um, and used for drainage. So that is something that we could look into. And then also I wanted to state that I know that uh, Daniel Garcia served on one of your committees and we try to get the realtors and the brokers to disclose when they were selling homes in our neighborhood that our neighborhood would flood. And uh, the last big one was June 2017, but of course they shot us down and there was nothing that we could do and it was a bigger challenge. But, and it's, you know, we took it to the city, we took it to the state and uh, it was shot down at the state. It was because the realtors, uh, real estate agents, what we were. So with this problem has been around. And then what, last question, when I was, uh, raised on Weisenberger in the late 50s, they put the big drains uh, in the street. And uh, so those don't, aren't any good. That was in the late 50s. I mean, they were bigger than, I, we could stand in them. And that was because of the flood. Cause I was, when I was six months old in the second floor of Montgomery Plaza in May of 1949 when it flooded here. So I remember that. So that was in the late 50s or the early 60s in case, and they were put on Weisenberger under the street. So there are big drains. So Cannon, are you aware of, so Cannon Henry is uh, our infrastructure manager in, for the stormwater program. Are you aware of what she's, what Eva's mentioning? So I'm not exactly aware of the street location, but there are some 84 inch pipes, large pipes that we do have, especially along Fifth and also going up in the Bailey industrial area as well. And those are the, some of the uh, infrastructure that we have assessed and currently they look clean and there's no problems with them. They're in great condition. So well, they're on wise about tell you that. There, there's just so much storm water. That's, that's the, and, and those evaluations that we did, I mean, they were, you know, you, you have smaller pipes and you need huge, you know, 10 feet pipes instead of two feet pipes. So that's the big problem. It's just the capacity. Okay. Thank you. This Go week, ahead. I've got a question about the uh, stormwater detention going back to the Templeton acute acute problem on Templeton. So, what do we need to do to prioritize Templeton? Where there there at least is a little bit of like unredeveloped property left on the northern part of Templeton. So perhaps that's a that's a candidate for a water detention place, I'm not sure. But what can we on Templeton do to prioritize the creation of a detention lo location around Templeton to deal with our problem? Um, that, well, so that's definitely something that we can take a look at um, in terms of available land um, and looking at the park to see how the park could be used. So, so that is something that we can take a look at uh, afterwards. Uh, Mr. Uh, he, he wasn't he wasn't talking about the park. He's talking there's undeveloped homes land down on the north side of Templeton uh, right. that are you know they're 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 just they're undeveloped you know old homes on Pier and Beam. You know at some point those likely will be gone. I would say uh, in in the in the future. You know that is maybe a good candidate for the city to come in and buy it all. And potentially make that a retention pond because it bottlenecks right there in the center of Templeton, uh, right there. So it, it I think that's what he was getting to, like not the park. That's, the park that's could correct. be another option, but hey, the, the park, park could be an option. Yeah, I don't know if that's a better solution or not. But right there on Templeton, right now, there's undeveloped spaces that, to Dane's point, are not always going to be there. So why doesn't the city just immediately claim those and build a detention? location and help alleviate this problem yeah because that, that's not an 80 million dollar project or a five-year project we could get that done no pretty quick 
So, there, so there, I, there's five or six homes, and you have Tesla on the other on the back side of them. So there's something that could possibly be done in the meantime to mitigate the issue. Uh, and, Hello, and, can can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Sorry. Yes. Uh, sorry, I just jumped on late, but I heard someone say that there was no flooding on Wimberley, and that's not true. There was flooding on Wimberley. Um, there was definitely flooding where I was on Wimberley, and um, further down toward Curry, I believe, or Wingate. So oh, this just was three hundred. Where the park is three seventeen. Yeah. The fire truck. I have video. The fire trucks couldn't even go down Wimberley. So Wimberley was flooded as well. Where that flume is at the park. I said minimal. There was. You should have seen it in twenty seventeen. Well, it went up well, to those houses like it did at Templeton. We're talking about now, and we couldn't get fire trucks down there. I have it on video. So. I know we didn't get any on Wapach either. Okay. Um, Sarvi had a question. Or... So, so I do know that we have been on, you know, it's 750. Um, so, so maybe take time for a couple more questions. I don't have anywhere to be. I don't have a house to go I, to. I, I have not a question, but more of a statement because I'm just reading the denial letter from the city that I got back in two and a half hours from them, saying that y'all scoped the drains and inspected them and found that the inlets were clear. I had took pictures of the city workers in Templeton just so I had timestamps of the day. It was August 23rd and August 29th when they went down the street and opened the drains. And then the 29th is when they scoped the drains. The storms were before the 23rd. It was the 17th and what, the, the 22nd, uh, or the, the, the 20th and 21st, you know? So they were probably clear because they had a tidal wave of water go through them three separate times. So they probably were clear. I would like to see if there was on record before when's the last time the city went back and scoped those drains because we didn't have rain six months prior to that, a heavy rain. So when was the last time that the city scoped the drains? Because they were probably backed up with debris before the, the two inch rain that we had on Wednesday. So. That's probably why I flooded on two inches because no one did scope it, you know, months before that. Likely, I don't know, uh, but I would love to know if it's on record when the last time they scoped it prior to the 17th. So we can uh, we can pull that information. I will say that we've got um, over um, or almost a thousand miles of storm drain citywide, and so we can't regularly go out there and TV all of the lines uh, all the time. So, yeah, so not asking, all not asking to do high risk, risk, not asking high risk priorities. And we did, we did go out. Uh, I think it was the nineteenth. I mentioned earlier in the PowerPoint. Can't remember the date. Uh, but before August, we, August twenty third, y'all were on the street. I have photos of. It. I'm looking at it right now. August twenty third, y'all opened the drains. I have another picture. August 29th, they were scoping the drains. I went up to them and say, "What are y'all doing? Oh, we're scoping the drains." I said, "Have y'all found anything?" They said, "No." I said, probably because you, we just had three huge uh, tidal waves of water go through the street. So, they, yeah, they are probably clear. And my denial letter says it. And I'm like, well, yeah, what, what, what do you, else do you expect? Uh, yeah, they're going to be clear after three huge range that push, through, push everything through. So that's why I want to know when the last time was before that, before August 17th. When was the last time Templeton got scoped? Probably, I bet it's six months plus. We can pull that information. I would love it. My name is Dane Steinhagen. Please send that to me. Let us all know, please. Okay. Mr. Shop, your hand is still raised. Did you get your question answered earlier or do you still have a question? Pete. Okay. I just want to mention real quick for for everybody still on the call. Um, I, uh, I did, you know, we did have a little Templeton meeting, um, you know, just just about like sandbags, some other things, things we could do what's going on and everything, possibly some other options. Um, if you guys want, uh, you know, I can put my phone number in the chat, uh, but love to have anybody else that's having any issues. Um, touch base with us, uh, you know, as we're finding new ways to prevent flooding and uh, possibly look at other options uh, to get some relief for this. So uh, my address is four, uh, 409 Templeton, uh, but I'll put all that in the chat if you guys want to see it before you go. 
love to get an email or a text from you guys and uh, keep you guys in the loop for what we're already talking about on Templeton as neighbors. Sounds good. Okay, I kind of think we've reached a, a good ending point. So Stacy, did you have any final words or anything? I just wanted to thank everybody. I want to thank our residents, Jennifer, uh, Claire, everyone. Thank you so much. I know it ran a little long, but if we could um, circle back, maybe, you know, after this and we don't have to have a meeting, but I'll try to get some communication between everybody. So I really appreciate everybody. This was very informative. Uh, and we will be sending out the, the PowerPoint uh, presentation slides and the link to the meeting. So uh, so if someone yes. missed it or they want to go back, uh, definitely we'll be sharing that information. Yes, I will share that with everybody. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Hey, yeah, hey, please, please leave it on for another minute or two so everybody can, uh, I just typed in my information. I'd yes. like everybody to get it. So please, uh, yes. please keep the call going for another couple minutes. Okay. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thanks, Dane. And Dane, I can make sure I can send um, some Yeah, the other, the other Dane said he talked to you, so I, I was expecting an email from that side, but I mean, uh, just every, I figured there's people on this call that we might not have their information. And, you know, I've talked to some other people on the other side of seven too that uh, you know, might might be willing to uh, uh, join our group and uh, maybe see what we can what we can do uh, to help prevent this in the future, and uh, you know, help each other out to uh, uh, get back to get some get some compensation back for this. Alrighty, sounds good. Yeah, Stacy, if you're still on, if you want to email that, uh, what I have, or if you've already sent it to Dane, I'm sure Dane will send it over to me. The other Dane, I know there's too many Danes. <laughs> yeah, whatever y'all need, just let me know. I'm here for y'all. Well, uh, yeah, shoot me an email so I have yours, uh, so I can kind of let you know what uh, uh, about the meeting we had. You know what what we're looking to do on Templeton, and uh, you know hopefully get some more contact since I know you have that Facebook group. Um, probably have a lot more. We can post something on there and get some contacts. I'm going door to door. I can only get so much, and I uh, passed out some flyers, and so I got some good feedback. But it's obviously still more than half of the half the neighborhood. I don't have their information. Okay, sounds good. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm gonna go eat dinner. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. I hope everyone has it. I mean, it's been a couple minutes, so. Um, if you don't, I mean, my address is there, but look forward to talking to all you guys. I'll be sending uh, something out this weekend or Monday. Uh, you know, me and uh, me and Ben and Dane uh, have a little bit to discuss, probably with Stacy as well, but waiting for some more, some more contacts, uh, contacts together, and I'll send something out. So, be, you know, if I have your email, be expecting something uh, for sure by Monday. All right. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, thanks everyone. Y'all have a good night. Good night.